Hi, neighbor, Laura McHugh, uh, author from Columbia, Missouri, lives in Columbia now. Uh, but Laura, I uh, was looking at your bio a little earlier, and you grew up, or you were born in Keokuk, Iowa, is that right? Uh, I was born in Fort Madison, Iowa. Yeah, it's right by Keokuk. Okay, well, that's yeah. cool, because my wife and I have really uh, discovered uh, we we go we try to go away every two or three months. Uh, you know, Airbnb gives you a lot of great options, and we stayed in Neota, Illinois. Uh, I think I said that correctly, and it was right across the river from Fort Madison, and we went across that uh, rickety old drawbridge, and, <laughs> yeah. and and we have fallen in love with Kiyosakwa, uh and those villages of Van Buren. So I don't know something yeah. about Iowa is really kind of uh, drawn us there, yet you started in that area and now you're in Columbia. So tell me how that happened. Yeah, I, I'm originally from there, right on the Mississippi. And my second book, Arrowwood, is set in Keokuk in one of those old houses on the river. because I love those two. But we moved down to the Ozarks when I was uh, seven or eight years old and lived down in Ozark County, down by Arkansas, down by the Arkansas line. And uh, grew up down there and in other towns in southern Missouri. I went to high school in Lebanon, which we had talked about. Uh, uh -huh. You're familiar, kind of familiar with that area. And yeah, I came to Columbia uh, for grad school. That's how I ended up here. So I've been here for a long time now. And what, what was grad school? What, what, was, your, what was your study? Uh, library and information science and computer science. Okay. And uh, are you... Uh, is that your vocation now, or do you say, no, I'm a full-time author, I got books to write? Yeah, I mean, I, I was a software developer for about 10 years uh, here in town, and I lost my job, you know, many years back, and that's when I wrote The Weight of Blood. I started writing while I was out of a job, and I got very lucky, and got, you know, a great contract, and got some contracts, and so I've been only working as a writer for, gosh, what's it been, eight, eight years or so now? maybe okay. since uh, I was riding the way to blood. And, you know, I don't know if that can continue. You know, things are kind of tricky in the publishing industry. Nothing's guaranteed. You really work by contract. And I'm about to turn in my fourth book, which is my last one that I have under a contract right now. So we'll have to see. Uh, cross your fingers. I get another contract. <laughs> now, I'd is, like that, to be doing it. Yeah. is that Random House, uh, Penguin? Uh, uh, yeah, I'm with Random House. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's back up a little bit to the present uh, uh, COVID pandemic, and uh, I wanted to just kind of uh, reach out and contact a wide variety of folks and say, "Hey, how are you surviving this?" And you know, the the idea of the pandemic press is to show how we're surviving and thriving, and maybe that's more wishful thinking. I don't know, but. Uh, I mean, uh, there's no blueprint for this. We talked about that in a, of the previous call that I had. And uh, it's like, you know, there's not a playbook. So um, we kind of make it up as we go, maybe. Uh, we figure out what works for us, what works for everybody else. Uh, so tell me what is working for Laura McHugh and her family right now? And are you all uh, uh, cooped up? Are you uh, in that... Uh, in this the quarantine uh, scenario here? Yeah, uh, I mean, my husband, he works in pharmacy, so he has to go to work. He's still going to work every day. And at first, you know, I started staying home with the kids. It was tough because I'm used to writing during the day alone in the quiet. And all of a sudden they're here all day, every day. And I was having to help them with all their technology and all their schoolwork. And it was really, it was pretty overwhelming at first. And as far as just, you know, all the stuff going on in the news and social media, that was of distracting for work for the first couple weeks but now they've changed how the online schooling is working it's a little bit easier now i'm not having to spend all day you know keeping on top of my kids helping them with all of that so I've, i'm back to working i'm trying to turn in this manuscript that is due and it's been kind of nice to be able to work on my own schedule not have to be getting up so early taking two different kids to school picking them both up at different times um, so it's kind of given me a more uninterrupted day in that sense but I mean every five minutes it's like I need a snack I'm hungry <laughs> you know, help me with this it's, so um, I mean there's a lot of distractions just trying to kind of work around that uh, I think it's getting better and 
I'm really hoping I can turn in this manuscript and have some time to watch a bunch of TV or read a bunch of books like everyone else seems to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, I think that would be nice because I, I don't mind social distancing. That's how I am normally. I'm just alone working and, you know, I mean, I miss seeing my family and friends in person, but I, I could sit at home forever, probably. Well, hopefully we don't have to. Uh, <laughs> hopefully not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my extrovert has really been challenged here um, as well as, and my wife's introvert has been challenged. Um, so we, we seem to have found maybe a happy medium and I, I tend to be, because uh, I, I, I started working from home uh, full-time freelancing and consulting in, in November. So, uh, but still I would go into the office that I was now a consultant for instead of a paid employee, I'd go there once a week. And uh, I, I, I really miss that, you know, uh, it, it's okay now, but once in a while I start, I just start getting heart crazy. I just need to talk. I need to see people, you know, and, yeah. and, and, uh, you know, my wife told me this morning, Kelly says, well, you know, if I'm going to be stuck in a pandemic with anyone, it would be you. So I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't, uh, it's her, she's my choice, obviously, but she's not annoying like I can be, see. So, <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're getting along okay, but I'm curious about your, your creative process. Uh, you said now there's distractions, maybe every few minutes sometimes. Uh, is, is your creative muse or your creative process something that kind of turns off and on? Or is it like, hey, I'm in the zone. I got to stay here. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, it's really, I just treat it like a job, uh, like any other job where every day I sit down and get started. And that's, you know, I just work on it. And so I don't really rely on, you know, the, whether I feel inspired or, or motivated or any of that. It's just I sit and work. But I mean, some days are better than others. And I do tend to get in the zone kind of more like late at night and want to stay up really late working. And that's another time when no one's bothering me because they're all asleep. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like to have music on. I don't like any noise at all. Unless, you know, if I'm in a coffee shop, I would go to the grind out here and, uh, and work there a lot. And just the coffee shop noise, just that kind of noise I would like. But yeah, that the quiet and just being able to focus is how I can really get okay. into it. Kind of the uh, ambient noise of yeah. Okay, now you're talking about the grind out on South Providence in that area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to the grind, right? Yeah. Woo! I miss it. I miss going there, getting my coffee. Well, what, what are you drinking there? Ah, uh, just regular coffee. Okay. And that's about it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> So you go to a coffee shop. See, I go to a coffee shop and get hot chocolate because I don't drink coffee. Oh. Uh, you know, or some sort of tea, and it's not even fancy. Just give me tea, right? Right. <laughs> uh, I, I told you before we hit record here that I just a few minutes ago downloaded um, The Wolf Once In. And I think that's the one that had a great review from, well, several great reviews. And one of them was from Lee Child. And uh, oh, I think that one was on Arrowwood. Lee Blur. Well, okay. I mean, he was okay. very kind, very kind to do that. So nice. Okay. Thing. Well, so then that's the one that I ha I don't have or I haven't read yet. And uh, you know, boy, to have impressed the masters of the craft uh, as a wannabe novelist myself, I'm curious what what does that do um, for you you know your psyche your confidence you're like well maybe I'm, I'm doing the right thing here <laughs> yeah I mean it's it's always so it's such a good feeling to have someone you know say something nice about your work no matter who it is but especially you know some of your writing heroes that does that does feel really good and I try to blurb people and do the same thing for other writers as much as I can too you know because people people need that uh, but you know, on the other hand, there's also, you know, everyone in the mystery community is very nice and very generous and very kind. And you are not going to hear a lot of them saying a bad word about someone's book. Everyone's very supportive Good. and very kind. So, I mean, it's part of it is, oh my gosh, you feel so grateful for anyone to take the time to say something kind about your work or to read your work. Absolutely. But also it's kind of like, blurbs are part of the business and people 
people say nice things. So, I mean, Lee blurbs, Lee blurbs quite a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people. It still felt wonderful. And I got to meet him in person oh, and cool. he remembered who I was. He shook my hand and he's like, you know, Arrowwood, oh my gosh. And he, he talked about it. Like he remembered the book. He actually read it, you know, wow. he's not one who just writes a blurb without reading it. So, you yeah. know, I thought, I thought that was so kind of him. And yeah. Was, yeah. He really invested himself there. Uh, so I'm curious, um, you're writing your fourth, uh, novel what what's the do you have a working title or a, a title yeah. for that yeah I'm calling it the dark of night right now but I mean with titles it's really hard to say they'll probably want to change it and that's fine uh, I just I would like to have really great titles but I can't always think of something that's really good so maybe my editor can help me out with that well uh, the way to blood arrowwood and uh, the wolf ones in are seem to all be uh, kind of have a common theme of uh, their mysteries, thrillers, people with secrets, yeah. um, secrets that should stay hidden but don't. Uh, how, is that uh, sort of like um, what's what's happening in this fourth book? Yeah, I mean it's another it's another kind of dark uh, mystery that takes place. This one is down in southern Missouri and northern Arkansas in the Ozarks. And it again deals with you know missing persons and murder and creepy small towns, which are all my favorite things that I, that I always like to write about. So uh -huh. uh, yeah, in that sense, it's really following that same kind of vein. I love writing about the Midwest, uh, especially those art region and all of that. So yeah, it follows along with those. Well, and and I was I was talking about the reviews a moment ago and. Uh... I know that that me as a as a creative person in in journalism for thirty plus years, if uh, I always liked you know kudos for a story, whether it won an award or you'd walk into the coffee shop and see somebody reading the paper and you know oh they're they're reading your stuff. But you could have a hundred of those examples, but if there was just one of somebody who says, "Eh, didn't care for it," for some reason I listen to that maybe a little bit more and i was reading one of the reviews on uh the way to blood i think it was the los angeles times uh i might be miss at miss after attributing that but uh the the uh, reviewer said uh <clears throat> something like in spite of uh despite a few missteps laura McHugh, and he went on with this very uh flowering very kind <laughs> statement but I thought, oh, whoa, whoa, missteps, what? So I'm going to ask you, what, what were your missteps in The Way to Blood? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to say uh, with book reviews and, and criticism that you get, you know, you really have no control over the book once it leaves you. And it's hard, but you just have to, that stuff comes in and, you know, you read it and sometimes you agree with it or feel like, oh, you know, maybe I could learn something from that. But a lot of the time it's opinion based. And, you know, I do, I remember that review, that one was from, it was one of the review journals. It wasn't LA Times because okay. that one was one of my, it's my favorite review I've ever gotten, the LA okay. Times, The Way to Blood, because it was fantastic. That's my favorite. This one was one of the trade reviews. And I, I remember reading that too and reading, aside from a few missteps, and I'm like, well, they had to put that in there. They want to make sure I knew that I wasn't perfect. You know, I had some missteps, but I'm not sure what they were particularly referring to. And I'm not, you know, none of us write a perfect book, but you can't please everyone because if you change some things and it pleases one person, that's not going to please another person. So it's, it's kind of important when you're writing to try to put those voices out of your head. It's difficult, but you can't please everyone. You have to write the book that you want to write and try to do the best job writing it that you can and make it a book that you're proud of and you're happy with and a book that readers will want to read and that they will enjoy. And that's just, that's all you can really do. And beyond that, I mean, you're gonna have to be able to deal with all that criticism. And you know, if, it, if, it, if those detracting voices affect you and bother you too much, don't read them. Because I have to say, for the most part, like when I started out, I remember thinking, critical reviews will be so good for me. They'll be so constructive, it'll help me learn as a writer, help me grow as a writer, see what maybe I'm doing wrong, what are those missteps, you know, what am I doing wrong that I can improve upon? That's almost never true <laughs> with a bad review. It's just most of the time, it's not about craft or technical things. It's usually about opinion. And I, I do like something. 
Yeah, and I do appreciate and understand, you know, if, if someone manages to point out something or I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's something I should work on or that. But you know, by that point, the book is already published. You can't go back and fix it. So you just have to, you know, moving forward, try to, mm -hmm. you know, take in any lesson that you get and, and try to use that. But Well, the, uh, you know, thinking about the, the writing process and you say you treat it like a job and you, you sit down and here's your schedule. You're going to, do you, do you look at it as in, I'm, I'm going to write five, six, eight hours a day, or I'm going to do 5,000 words or, how do you gauge your productivity? Uh, I know productivity and creativity sometimes sort of clash because one is kind of inspired driven and the other one is, uh, well, you've got to sign contract. You've got to, you've got to deliver a, a product. Yeah. And I've tried different approaches to that. When I was writing The Weight of Blood, my goal was to write two pages a day. And, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot. But if you can be consistent and do it every day, day after day, two pages builds up over time more quickly than you would think. And I wouldn't always reach that goal. And sometimes I would, you know, have to go back and delete a bunch of pages. You know, it didn't always work out. But if you're consistent with a small goal, I found that worked really well for me. But uh, now it's a little bit different. Um, I'm trying to do, you know, just work all day while the kids are in school, as much of that time as I can, just be writing and working. And part of the reason things have changed a little bit with how I set my goals and how I measure my productivity is that, you know, with Way to Blood, my first book, I didn't have anything else that I had to do that was, you know, book related or writing related. It was just that. But now, you know, being a published writer, and having you know some books that are already out, uh, Wolf is coming out in paperback soon. Um, I have the new book I'm trying to finish. There are all these other things that you have to do that are writing related that aren't really writing. So I might spend a lot of my day, you know, things like this, like doing an interview or right. um, doing a written Q and A. Um, I'm writing an essay right now to coincide with you know the Wolf paperback coming out. I have to get that done and. I'm going to be teaching an online course and I'm trying to get all the lessons for that written out. Cool. And I'm doing, you know, I have Zoom book club meetings and I'm doing a book club with uh, Truman State where I went to school and oh, yeah? launching something with that. That's the only thing. So I have all these things that I work on that aren't really contri contributing to my productivity of getting, you know, getting my manuscript done. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? So it's harder, I think, like I'm still doing work all day, but I might not necessarily get, you know, a thousand words or or two pages or that sort of thing. So it's slightly different, but the main thing is I just try to work every day and I work seven days a week, maybe not all day, all the time, mm -hmm. but I do something with my writing work every, every day. When you said when you get this uh, manuscript finished and it's sent off, you're going to either read or just, you know, binge watch, maybe something on TV. What, yeah. what do you plan to watch? What, what's caught your fancy? Oh my gosh, I have, I have a big long list of all the things uh, that I've been waiting to read and to watch because that's kind of my reward when I finally turn something in. Like, oh, now I can just really indulge in all this. My to read stack is just, well, there's not one stack. There's like stacks uh -huh. <laughs> everywhere around my house and I have sure. all kinds of things in my online queue for movies and things I wanna watch. Um, I'm trying to think, what shows there oh, i can't think of it now off the top of my head but uh i like to watch you know crime shows and creepy scary shows gee that's surprising yeah there's a lot of that there's a lot of that out there right now yeah. it's just so good such great material i haven't watched ozark season three yet so i want to watch that and you know a bunch of a bunch of things like that mm -hmm. so i i'm looking forward to that because i do need a break after i turn a manuscript in i know a lot of writers will be like oh an hour after I turned it in, I've started on the next book and I'm just, and, and that's not me. Like I, I need a little break to kind of <laughs> decompress, decompress. And then my revisions will come in and I'll start working on that. So um, now, even, even though you've, you've got decompression coming up and you're looking forward to that, are there already ideas though? Little plot lines, little snippets of dialogue working, kind of bubbling in your head for number five? Well, what I've been doing, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm going to be out of contract after this book is turned in. And so I'll be pitching something new for a new contract. So I'm trying to come up with my new idea. And so, okay. you know, I have some ideas, but I have to think of what is the idea that I want to really pursue that I think I can really 
turn into something. And I haven't really decided yet. And so I'll be thinking about that a lot once I turn this one in. Because generally when I'm trying to finish at the end, finish a book, I can't, I can't think too much about something else. Like my focus is just all, just all on that one project and getting that done. And I have to be so deeply inside of that. But yeah, pretty soon I need to get my brain going and I need to <laughs> have some really good ideas. So well, it, in spite of pandemic and your change of schedule, some additional distractions, uh, sounds like you're really just going with the flow and figuring things out. Um, I wonder though how much of our current new normal will be permanent, um, you know, a month, two months, a year from now. Yeah. Will we still, and I'm curious in what your thoughts are on this, uh, will we be, how different might life be? I mean, it might even be real subtle, but uh, have you thought about that? Yeah, I have. And I mean, I think, especially kind of around here in Missouri and some of, you know, my old hometown, all those places, people are still just out and about like normal and wanting to be out and about like normal. And I think a lot of people around here probably will get back to normal pretty quickly. But I think for myself and some others, I might be more hesitant. I might just work at home instead of going to the coffee shop if I'm worried that maybe I'll catch something if I go there versus I can just stay here and not worry about it so much. So I think that'll probably ease up over time depending on how things go. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people around here, they're just ready. They're ready to get back. And yeah. <laughs> okay. For the, for the here and now then, at least while we're still supposed to be cooped up and have the stay at home order, uh, what are you and your family doing? It might be unique to yourselves or something you figured out as way to stave off uh, being stir crazy? Well, yeah, like I, I love being at home, so it doesn't bother me. Uh, for my kids, you know, they like being around their friends. And it's been kind of nice at various points. They've been able to really be each other's friend and do things together, which has been really nice. Now, that doesn't go well all the time. <laughs> Get tired of each other a little bit. But I found that's kind of nice, that forced togetherness. It kind of makes them find a friend in each other. And I mean, I, something I've been doing that kind of keeps me calm, I have this Nancy Drew puzzle. It's a thousand piece puzzle of all these vintage Nancy Drew covers. I'm like, oh, this is so relaxing. And I work, you know, I take a break and I work on that. And I try to get, I try to get my kids to do the puzzle with me. No. <laughs> like, it's fun. It's relaxing. It'll help your, your mental health, you know, just work on this puzzle. Like, yeah. They, they have no interest. So, yeah. And how old are they? They, one of them just turned 11 a few days ago, and the other one is 13. She, she's about to turn 14. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, being, being a little, little stir crazy, probably no matter what, right? Yeah. You know, they're just, they're social creatures. They want to see their friends and they're used uh -huh. to seeing them all the yeah. time. And, and that's hard not being at school and. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I've had a great conversation here. Appreciate the time that you've given me to kind of pick your brain about, uh, and you know, really my ulterior motive here is to sort of get to know you a little bit better because, you know, I want to, I want to know how to pitch one of the three or four unpublished manuscripts that I have, right? Oh, nice. And, you know, where do you go with this? What do you do? Um, I, one more thing though, I'm curious, I, I keep using the word curious because I have a question here. What is your big curiosity? Um, like what, what big question do you spend a lot of time pondering, wondering, say, oh, I wish I knew about, or I wish I knew how, what, how would you feel in that blank? I mean, as a crime writer, I spend a lot of time wondering why people do the terrible things they do, what motivates them towards, you know, violence and, and crime and that sort of thing. And I, I spend a lot of time wondering about that. Why do people do these things? Yeah. You know, and that really okay. drives my work. So yeah, trying to figure that out because that's what a story is a mystery story. You're trying to figure that out. Why would someone do this? And you know, how did that happen? Sure. Well, in here we watch, we like the, the crime shows, especially the like the true crime. You know, the, the man or the woman is living kind of a double life, nobody knew they were like psychotic or whatever. Right. And, and what I always want to know is when did it start? What when was there a switch that they went from being? sort of crazy to wow now they're homicidal maniac you know right yeah what triggered that what caused that yeah that's fascinating that's part of the whole backstory thing 
Yeah, well, when you and when you figure that out, let me know. And in the meantime, I'm going to get uh, to reading uh, The Wolf Wants In. I'm going to finish first uh, The Way to Blood, and I'll have Arrowwood to still fill in. But, you know, I brought up those missteps earlier from that one review. So as I'm going through The Way to Blood the second time, I'm, I'm going to look for those missteps, I guess, and find out what are they talking about. Maybe one day I'll read it and look for the missteps, but <laughs> I'm too busy right now. <laughs> well, and I'll let you get back to work. Laura, anything else you want to add or any a shout out to anybody? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And it's nice to meet you virtually. I'm familiar, you know, we're friends online, but it's yeah. nice to see face to face. Okay. So best thank of you. luck with the rest of the quarantine. <laughs> thank you. And you too.